Yeah, when you see a title like that, you know you're in for a crazy ride. And well, I'm not here to disappoint, which is why I'm starting things off with the most evil chefs the show has had the displeasure of dealing with over the years. The devil works hard, but these contestants worked harder. At what, you ask? Well, being completely evil. Manipulation, sabotage, you name it. And I have to shout out this comment from one of my viewers, since they put it best. As the series went on, the contestants became more freakish. Couldn't have put it better myself. Anyway, first up, Tiffany's behavior was honestly quite frustrating. She had this tendency to get drunk and spread rumors, which made everything worse and caused unnecessary tension and conflict within the team. Like, really. She was HK's very own devil. What really got to me was her hypocrisy, which ranks in my top three of her worst traits. She claimed to hate kids and believed they wouldn't appreciate fine dining, as if that justified serving them burnt pizza. I really hate cooking for children. Kids don't know what fine dining is, so their opinions really don't matter to me. Yet, around the same time, she decided to mock the blue team for screwing up their dinner service. It got so bad that the red team had to step in and defend them. That led Tiffany to think the rest of them were beneath her, as she continued to taunt them, even in the dorms. Here's how you treated me. You're here, I'm here. Ba, 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 ba. Don't do that. She continued to insist that they shouldn't be concerned about their pride and should only focus on the customers. It's not about you in this competition, it's about the fucking customer and the food. Do you realize that? Funny you say that, Tiffany. Here's the thing, those kids you dismissed, they're customers too, and they deserve as good a dining experience as anybody else. Remember that potato dish? But honestly, I couldn't call it a dish in good faith. It honestly looks like it could have hurt somebody. I mean, Tiffany's double standards really didn't sit well with me. Let's take a look at the second dinner service, shall we? She put her manipulativeness front and center by deliberately sending out an incomplete order of scallops just to shift the blame onto Barbie and make her look incompetent. And she only did this because of a personal grudge, rather than out of genuine concern for the team's performance. Here you go, Barbie. I'll just throw you under the bus because that's where you belong. She was also straight up dishonest, like when she suggested firing up extra sea bass for insurance. Why don't we fire like four more fucking bass right now? Hey. Newsflash, here in Hell's Kitchen, they cook Dory to order. She also deflected blame onto her teammates when confronted by Ramsey, and the entire team got yelled at instead. To top it off, she acted like it wasn't even her fault in the first place. I don't understand why I'm getting yelled at. I'm trying to fucking put out food for the customer. I mean, I'm pissed off that he's mad at me. And I mean, teamwork and cooperation were completely foreign concepts to her. Yeah, she was nasty, with a capital N, no doubt and her relentless, unwarranted hate towards Barbie has been called out over and over again by fans of the show for being borderline racist. No, I'm not about to get You wanna get fucking choked out? I'm not about to get choked out, you dumb and cunt! God, it pisses me off even talking about it. Remember this incident from season five? So Royce started complaining about Mexican cuisine, making stereotypical comments about flour tortillas, and even suggesting he could make better tacos than Kimmy, a Memphis native. Wow. I will not let it happen again. Tiffany, who had earlier advocated for a no bitching policy, jumped right in to keep the chaos going. She then got super drunk on a bunch of wine and laid it out clear as day to Kimmy and Robin. Mother was like, what? God, if somebody wanted to make a director's cut of this season that completely wrote Tiffany out, I'd watch it in a heartbeat. But anyway, I absolutely agreed with Brian when he said this. Cruel and unusual punishment to have to look at her and I'm done with her. So instead of addressing the issue constructively, she used Roy Royce's complaints to pin the blame on Danielle, Dana, and Christina. Like, way to throw them under the bus for something they didn't even say. You are in, sadly, for the most difficult punishment in the history of Hell's Kitchen. This kind of behavior was nothing short of mean and bitchy, and it seriously jeopardized the team's dynamic for the upcoming service. Like, hello, this isn't high school. 
all in all, her attitude sucked. And it's not like her performance was any better. Oh, but she made sure to criticize Barbie's chicken cooking skills every chance she got. Cooking a breast of chicken is, is about as easy as taking a shit. Anybody can do it. Are you that dumb? But the sad part is that she fucked up something as simple as mashed potatoes. Yeah, Put chef. that down. Look at me. Shit burn mash. Get out. Get out. But to the relief of Hell's Kitchen fans around the globe, that overconfidence was what ultimately sunk her. Pride cometh before the fall. But hey, before I leave her alone, let's fondly remember the time sous chef Andy called her out for her poor attitude. Tiffany, sorry. No, you're fucking not. Yes, I am. You're the floppiest cook I've ever seen in my whole entire life. Sorry. Oh yeah, she was a huge mess. And oh, by the way, did you know that she's married now? And she took her partner's last name. And oh boy, you won't believe what it is. Tiffany Gross. Which I mean, could you imagine a more fitting last name considering she did this? Tiffany, what the fuck are you doing? And this. Good job. And this. Good job, burping. <laughs> See what I mean? You have such a fucking attitude. Why don't you take a walk and Dana take over her section? Yes, chef. <laughs> And congrats, by the way, that makes you the only contestant to this date to be kicked out of the kitchen by a sous chef. Did she have any shame? Uh, apparently not. On her way back to the dorms, Tiffany seemed upset that her teammates had made her look bad. Yeah, even then, she refused to take accountability. But lo and behold, this next chef is the definition of a sore loser. I'm gonna definitely blackball you guys because you got fucked me so royally tonight. That's the runner-up of season eight, threatening to exclude his finale brigade from any work in whatever cities he'd be in. What a great display of maturity and sportsmanship, huh? The HK community has christened him as Russell, and you'll soon see why. High schoolers can be pretty annoying. But hey, nothing justifies a grown-ass man stooping to bullying, just because he was in a bad mood about losing the prom planning challenge. We're doing this for you. How about you back up a little bit? This is not a joke. I'm not here to play. If I didn't know any better, I'd think it was his prom that they'd ruined. Anyway, let me spell something out for you. Threats aren't an appropriate response to instructions, even if they were constant. At all. Also, in their defense, he did a pretty bad job at decorating. I'm not doing this for my 15 minutes of fame. I'm doing this for a fuck. Career, so step off. Boy, watch your language. I'm a grown ass man. Bro, they are your customers, and flipping out on them is proof enough that he could not handle being Ramsey's head chef. Like I said, the dude was a bully, so unnecessarily aggressive. Now, we know how Russell felt about Trev, right? He's just like a zit on your ass, and you want to pop the motherfucker, but you know it's going to hurt and you can't reach it. That's Trevor. The dude couldn't help himself from micromanaging the guy and later admitted to sabotaging him. Oh, dude, it's way too, it's way too what? You can't do it on the heat. Yeah, on the corner. This is exactly how Chef Scott told me okay. how to do it yesterday. But did you take it down to syrup? Yes. Come on, that's not a good look, man. See, I'm not the biggest Trev fan, but even I felt sorry for him when Russell threatened to assault him. You talked to me like you talked to me before about that salmon? I would have slapped the shit out of you. Well, he definitely crossed the line there. Lost all my respect, that's for sure. Not that he had it in the first place, but... Anyway, Russell's arrogance was put center stage throughout his time on the show, and it wasn't winning him any fans. Moreover, remember how he blamed it all on his team for losing the finale? I chose the team that I wanted, and I thought they would help me win, and in fact, they helped me lose, so... You know how bullies seek out power because they feel powerless themselves? Case in point, Russell. In the end, Russell's talent as a chef was overshadowed by his abusive behavior and arrogance. No amount of skill would ever make anybody want to work with him. Speaking of bullies, this next contestant was irredeemable. Stop acting like a baby girl. 
I can't even wrap my head around how infuriating Scott Lee's relentlessness towards Trev was, with that baby girl nickname of his. I mean, every time. Every damn time he opened his mouth to insult Trev, it was something sexist. God, they pulled Trev out of retirement for this? Trading one bully for another. Again, like we learned with Russell, I don't care how good you are in the kitchen, if you're an asshole. How is he so unsympathetic to Trev's allergic reaction and taunting him for it? We're prima donna at, man. He's still getting his <laughs> looked at. <laughs> You all right, baby girl? It's not like he could control it. And what was wrong with the rest? Especially Jose. It's pretty shocking that someone who claimed family meant everything to him would encourage behavior like that. He had to know that Trev was uncomfortable with it. Oh, you're saying that you guys took care of all this without me? Yeah, baby girl, got your back. I see how it is. It's ironic because Jose always seemed so intense on being a hero to his family but he ended up being just as much of a villain as Scott Lee. Like, I mean, if a good person allows a bully to bully, you've got two bullies. Anyway, moving on, it's crazy how we got to see so many different personalities on Hell's Kitchen. Apart from Jason Underwood and Frank Kala, this next contestant was one of the rare few that had a shit personality, both on the show and outside the show. I'll fix it right now, So give me a proper fresh lobster towel. Get it. Yeah, I understand. So concentrate. Okay, sir. You should see the blatant racism he had for Hassan on Facebook. And thankfully, people had the presence of mind to call him out on it. The show only proved how thick-headed the guy was. Criticism just bounced off of him like he had a force field for the stuff. He never showed a single second of genuine self-reflection. Only a lot of blustering and putting on a show. It's astonishing how many opportunities he had to learn from some real top-notch chefs and industry leaders. Like, hello, Ramsey's right there. Instead, he chose to dig his heels in and deny their expertise, acting like he knew better in spite of all the years they had on him. Remember his comment after losing the creative sliders challenge? What the f do they know? That's why they're running burger joints. Yeah, I'm sure Ramsey and Christina Wilson work at McDonald's. I saw them at the one down the street from me. And just look at him constantly bitching and talking back to the judges. Like, he had so much growing up to do. So a lobster roll is a lobster roll, and then a slider is something completely... I didn't say it was a lobster roll, because it's made with shrimp, obviously. Is this a slider? To me, it is, Chef. To you, it's not. He really thought he did something revolutionary by refusing to accept any feedback. If I asked you for a lobster roll, would you do me a slider? <laughs> slider is. Like, you knew he was trouble from the very first service. Matt's behavior on the fish station was nothing short of immature. And when he and Andrew got into an argument over the scallops, things took a turn for the worse. When Ramsey found out that the scallops were raw, he blamed Andrew for it and suggested checking camera footage for evidence. And I have to say this, Ramsey's reaction was entirely warranted. If I hear you talk about a camera one more time, I'll stick a GoPro up so you can see how you are. Sorry, bro, this is Hell's Kitchen. We don't break the fourth wall here. And what do you know, wanna be Eminem here, even challenge Ramsey to a fight during his elimination confessional. If I was on the street right now and he came up to me with that same I'd him up. Seriously, how low can you go? Well, we're jumping from one poor excuse for a person to another. Or two, because I couldn't decide if Aaron or Steve was the worst villain of season 13. They're both on my list because of their bitter, obnoxious attitude towards our man, Mr. 100. Sir, if you don't get the fuck away from me, I'm gonna beat the living fuck. And like, leave Sterling alone, my dude. Dude's just having a good time and cooking up some great food. The key ingredient I used was love. <laughs> Agreed. Nobody, not even Ramsey, could go that far in his career if he didn't love cooking. But Aaron just had to be a pick me. Guess what? Love's not a ingredient, asshole. And don't even get me started on how he was playing the martyr during his plea. As much as I'd love to run a restaurant for you, I'd love to be a Michelin star chef, but I don't think winning Hell's Kitchen is actually gonna get me any close to my goal. Oh, Aaron, you really outdid yourself on that one. So you decided to quit the competition because you were well aware that your lackluster performances were leading straight to elimination. 
huh? How brave. A tactical retreat, right? And, oh, let's not forget that absolutely pathetic excuse you came up with. I mean, seriously? Anyone in their right mind would consider themselves lucky to be mentored by THE Gordon Ramsay. How could that not lead to so many new doors opening up for you? But he was just a weaselly little man who gave up the second the going got tough. I think you would have learned a lot more here. And you're not willing to fight for it. Remember how at one point he labeled half of his teammates dead weight and conspired with Steve to undermine them? So I don't want the downers on our crew. You know, honestly, I say we just tell us what Yeah. This is coming from a guy who served raw scallops, despite being shown how to cook them. Wow, I have no words. But here's what I do have words for. Both of them loved kissing each other's asses. He was so unnecessarily petty. Like, despite losing the dog show planning challenge to Sterling, he called that winning dish of his no better than fast food. If I had to describe Sterling's crab cake in one word, it'd be fast food. You can see even the HK editors were having none of his attitude. Well, Sterling was fast, and, well, he did serve food, so I guess he was half right. Shout out to all the editors in the world. The ones working on Hell's Kitchen for sure, and mine. Well, moving on again. This next chef had a terrible decline as season 12 progressed. Like one viewer pointed out, he quickly let his misogyny show once he was transferred to the red team. Any guesses? Yeah, that's Anton for ya. It's been like 10 years since I've worked with a girl in the kitchen. Women are more sensitive than men. Girls do get offended a lot easier. Funny how for some people, sensitivity means weakness, cowardice, or vulnerability. For Anton too. He saw it as super feminine and, in his eyes, somehow inferior. But let's put this into perspective. Men who assume that women are quick to take offense might actually be more worried that these women won't put up with their sexist remarks or won't find their shitty jokes funny. It's not about women being overly sensitive. It's more about these men fearing that they won't be able to get away with everything anymore. He was also so creepy. First with his comments about the sorority girls, which many of you guys pointed out too. I got all these sorority girls coming running out from every door, all different directions. And how he objectified Olympic figure skater Rachel Flat during one of the rewards. I'm not big on ice skating, but I'm an ass man. And the girl definitely has a little booty on her. Yikes. Just. Yikes. Fed up with Aaron's repeated mistakes in his last service, Ramsey finally let him have it for overcooking the Wellingtons. Anton, however, insisted that it was the oven's fault, claiming it was different from the one in the blue kitchen. An explanation that was so ridiculous and hard to believe that, well, nobody believed it. Like, I've mentioned it before, and I still don't get it. Despite sous chef Andy's attempt to explain that she had already coached the red team on the oven's correct settings, Anton dismissively refused her guidance simply because she was a woman. Normally yeah. for next door, it's 18 minutes, you're five minutes on the side. I let it rest for five minutes. Stop yelling at me. I've told them it's 14 minutes. Yeah, that actually happened. As the tension escalated, Anton seemed hell-bent on provoking sous chef Andy by asserting that he had everything under control. Don't think I'm gonna let some little girl get in my face. Like, hello? The little girl in question is one of Gordon Ramsay's most trusted sous chefs start ripping a new ass because you got issues on being a woman in the kitchen. No, Anton. I think you have issues with women in the kitchen. And I'm just going to piss you off more on purpose. Jeez, I absolutely can't stand this guy. Not gonna lie, though, I enjoyed every single second of sous chef Andy ripping him apart. Don't you talk back to me! Don't you ever I'm talk not back to me! Back to yes, you are! Pull it together! He simply had a hard time accepting or respecting female authority, and I don't think he would have ever spoken to Ramsay like that. You guys are right. He was nothing if not a chauvinist prick. And the last person on my list is a classist schmuck who disrespected waiters, bragged about how great he was with Asian cuisine, only to crash and burn. I don't like waiters, fuck them, they're annoying. And that has to be Dan. What a tool, seriously. He had a lot of nerve calling waiters annoying, when all he did was whine like a toddler throughout the entire 11th season. I 100% agree with this guy over here. If you have no respect for the wait staff, you have no respect for the customer's experience, and you have no business running a restaurant. Running a restaurant? How about being in a restaurant in the first place? Anyway, Dan's a big red flag. 
He showed how he was comfortable being rude and dismissive to people he thought were lower than him. His performance in the finale absolutely sucked, and I hope he made it up to Mary for costing her the victory. Dan could single-handedly be the reason why Mary loses Hell's Kitchen tonight, man. To quote this Reddit user, he was a grade A asshole. And now, the biggest douche award goes to... I don't know. You decide. But this next contestant's journey puts literally everyone else to shame. From Jackie Fook swagger to whatever Tiffany Johnson was up to, get ready to meet some of the most toxic chefs ever to grace Hell's Kitchen. And this contestant right here stirred up drama like nobody's business. <laughs> the foot champion of the world! When Jackie made her first appearance in season 15, she walked in like she owned the place. With a swagger that'd make even the most conceited people blush, she sized up the competition and came to the conclusion nobody stood a chance against her. She was tough, she was beautiful, she was sexy, and well, she was ready to kick ass if it came down to it. And nope, that's not my analysis, but her own. I am the epitome of Jersey. Yeah, you should have realized something was fishy when I called her sexy. You should know by now that objectification is not my speed. Anyway, Jackie thought she was invincible, and she carried that attitude right from the beginning till the bitter end. I'm going to destroy everybody. Nobody's even gonna come close. You're all gonna cry to your mommies. She wasn't just gloating. She meant it. If you ask me, she really defined her personality in episode four, when her duck dish flopped in its eponymous challenge, earning her a mere five points. As punishment, the red team prepped ducks and dined on duck feet sandwiches. But guess what? Jackie wasn't phased by the meal. I mean, look at her go. God. But of course, her attitude got under Mises' skin. Jackie's a joke. She doesn't take this seriously at all. She is a shame face for this team. Well, yeah, maybe. Because the next thing she did was even more ridiculous. You probably know where I'm going with this, but check out what she renamed the menu. I'm gonna put the list. Jackie Roll the List. Surely the idea had to have stemmed from her last name. At least I hope so. But sous chef Christina didn't find it funny a single bit. Never again, I swear to God. Liz, Eddie, shut up. Sit down. Just sit down. Although Jackie tried to defend herself, sous chef Christina wasn't here for it. She sent Jackie to the chef's table and laid into her, saying she'd have been fired if it were her kitchen, and called her the cancer of the team. Jackie brought her whole morale down. She has to go. I'm, I'm done with her. And believe me, that insult was far from unfounded. But Jackie refused to admit defeat to her superior. You would be fired if you if you work for me. If you want to have it. Oh, you don't care? No, no. You don't care? No, no. The arrogance, I tell ya. Something must have gotten to her since her performance started dipping. In episode six, Jackie found herself singled out as the weakest link by Ashley. And this completely set her off. Amanda and Jackie show. Jackie decided to take the fight back to the dorms, too. I just don't like two-faced, fake-ass bitches with fake-ass You're fake. Dude, shut the up, dude. And nope, she didn't think twice about making some very, very serious threats. You know what I should be doing? Breaking your face right now. Well, if you've been lucky enough to avoid meeting a bully in your life, let me show you a perfect example. You know, you should have watched like how to cook videos before you came here. Oh, you upset? Go cry in your room, little girly. And well, she had a unique way of venting her frustration. I beat this bitch, I beat that bitch, I beat that bitch. I tied your fluffy headed ass. Yeah, violence just seemed to be her go-to thing. But at least Ashley was bold enough to stand up to her, unlike Ariel, who got caught in the crossfire during prep. I do it a cup. Where's the cup measure? I don't, I do it by eye a cup. You can't measure a cup with your eyes? Jackie was more into cooking by feel, while Ariel wanted to stick to the script. Who's ready don't to do die? it by eye? It's a recipe for a reason. You are aggravating me right now. Ariel, you may as well just let it be, because Jackie's antics are something only she can understand. Well, you need to make this 
Bert Blanc, bro. Here, you need to do this. I'm not doing it by eye. I follow recipes. Jackie had lost the only friend she had out of the entire cast, and that spelled trouble for her real quick. In episode 9, everyone seemed to have a bone to pick with her during deliberations. And how do you think she handled it? Them two, they f up service and made us lose. They f kill it in service every time. When yep, right on cue. And in the midst of all that nonsense, she ended up dropping a pretty huge bombshell that she'd only been cooking for three months. But that means you're not ready for BLT. I got oh, seven, yeah, I'm I got, ready for BLT. I got seven years on you and six months. To make things worse, she couldn't resist poking at Kristen. She was far more tenured, but Jackie tried to say that they were on the same level. But Kristen knew better. And this is when things started spiraling out of control. When Jackie tried to get a lighter from her later on, Kristen was fixing to smash her face. In. And boy, did that set her off. You touch my lighter, I will punch you in the face. Punch in the give face. Give me my lighter, Jackie. Punch me in the face. Jackie, give me my And she didn't just stop there. Either light your cigarette or give me my lighter. Honestly, I'd rather not get involved at that point. But Kristen had it coming. I'm what are you going to get the out of my What face. are you going to get the out of my But thankfully, better heads prevailed. Ramsey eventually had to step in and say, enough is enough. And you know it's bad when he normally lets the drama play out to help with ratings. So what did she have to say for herself? They feel like I'm not professional. And maybe they're just intimidating. I mean, maybe they thought I was going to kill them all. I don't know. There really is nobody like her, is there? And honestly, thank God for that. But I can think of someone similar. Now, Tiffany claims that she cared about food more than her family. Not sure if that's the flex she thought it was, considering she failed to show it on the show. Ladies want men fit, men fit. Yes, sir. If you ask me, she was more into stirring the pot than actually stirring any pots in the kitchen, if you catch my drift. And Tiffany proved all that and more in the very first episode. I'm trying to prove that I'm not just some dumb dizzy blonde that looks really good. Yeah, we'll see about that. Because her signature dish looked anything but pretty. I have a lamb schnitzel with a rosemary and maple infused lamb gloss. But what was Tiffany's excuse for bringing up, in Ramsey's words, a bunch of wet diapers? I accidentally just kind of poured the sauce over it in a hurry. Great start, Tiff. But meanwhile, someone was taking notes about her attitude. I just don't understand what goes through some of these blonde bitches' heads. I don't get it. Yup, that's Kimmy. And she made a promise to herself to watch Tiffany's every move. Now, messing with Ramsey aside, let's see her take on some of her competitors. Like, take the scallop challenge, for example. Tiffany didn't hold back when she saw Barbie slacking off at the station. I don't understand why you can't cook the scallops. Really not hard at all. And to make things worse, she didn't hesitate once to call her out, all the while dropping some pretty nasty slurs in the same breath. Eventually, the red team managed to seal the win, and Tiffany had absolutely absolutely zero empathy for what the men had in store. See ya! We're gonna have a great day and you guys are gonna have a day. Wasn't even that hard of a challenge to win. Now, coming to the dinner service, Tiffany found herself on the garnish station. When she raised concerns about some missing scallops, Barbie brushed her off and sent up an incomplete order anyway. So Tiffany decided to play dirty, knowingly sending the flawed dish to the pass to put Barbie in a pretty compromising position. Chef scallops right here. Here you go, Barbie. I'll just throw you under the bus because that's where you belong. In hindsight, everybody knows Tiffany's probably the most horrible contestant the show has ever seen. And her sly move here doesn't come as a shock anymore. She was just being herself. But getting back into it, Barbie overcooking her scallops only added fuel to the fire. Once again, Tiffany didn't hesitate to pin the blame on her. Just cook it right. Like, you just sank us. Desperate to salvage the situation, she suggested firing extra sea bass as insurance. But her plan backfired when Ramsay caught wind of it. After being thrown out of the kitchen, Tiffany got real pissed. Back at the dorm, she dropped a bunch of profanity and even trashed the place while she was at it. The two fish that I took out of the house went out to the house, went out to the I mean, I wouldn't be able to stand being around someone like this, but the red team was helpless. The following day, Tiffany was rudely awakened by Barbie's noisy dishwashing and stomping around. And let's just say she didn't take it lying down, literally. 
What are you doing? Really? I just washed the dishes. I, just I came out here with you going like this. She just would not stop talking. You're about to get choked out. Knock it off. Grow up. You're 33. I'm not about to get choked out. You're going to get choked out? I'm you not get choked out, you dumb but Barbie kept a cool head somehow. Honestly, I want what she's having. Now, do you remember the time when Tiffany plainly stated she couldn't care less about pleasing the kids that came to Hell's Kitchen? I really hate cooking for children. Kids don't know what fine dining is. Their opinions really don't matter to me. Well, she meant it, because when she sent out her first attempt after like a year's wait, half of the pizza was completely burned. I'm talking like 100% carbon. When Ramsay got in her face about it, Tiffany was completely unfazed. I really don't like kids at all. You know, remember when she said she loves food more than her family? I'm starting to think she doesn't love her family very much. Anyway, that's none of my concern, but her rapport with Barbie definitely is. The two of them simply couldn't seem to get along. Yelling at me? I'm sick of the yelling. You want to talk? Talk! Do not yeah. yell! And it happened again and again and again. Even sous chef Andy had enough of her at some point. You're the sloppiest cook I've ever seen in my whole entire life. Sorry. No, you're not. You have such a Attitude. Yeah, I don't blame her. Tiffany had a knack for getting under everybody's skin. Now, her elimination was something the red team and everyone watching from home very much looked forward to. The drama was so bad that it was really starting to take the fun out of the show. But Tiffany, this is how she reacted. I never thought I'd be kicked out of this competition this early. Wait, did she say early? Well, I think you overstayed your welcome, my girl. You're late, if anything. But of course, it wasn't just the red team. The blue team had their own share of toxic contestants. Anton Testino's arrival in season 12 added more than his fair share of drama. In one of the episodes, Anton found himself in hot water back at the dorms. Rochelle reached out to see if he was all right, but Anton? Well, he was trying to be the hero he wasn't cut out to be. I'm pissed because I kind of let the team down. Why? Win. Yeah, none of them could figure out what he was talking about. But Anton was confident, so it must have made sense at least in his head. Just like this next bit. So part of me feels like I kind of let Ridge down in a way. You ain't everybody babysitter, man. I agree, it makes no sense. Meanwhile, Jason was losing his shit over the whole thing. But Anton kept trying to establish his position as the permanent leader of the blue team, even though everybody else had already moved on. And the way literally everybody but him was feeling made that real evident. That's fucking stupid. Could not agree more. But let's take him at his word for a second. Give the devil his due. For someone who took so much pride in being named leader, he wasn't showing it in episode 10. When Jason tried to get Anton's attention during the dinner service, Anton was laser focused on his cooking. Or at least he looked like he was. We have four minutes out. You heard that, right? How much time you need on that, Anton? Ah. Uh, if you're in charge, then maybe, I don't know, act like it. This is a kitchen. Think quick, act quick, cook quick. And that's all that matters in my mind at that particular moment. And Jason had literally no idea what was going on because of him. The problem with Anton is that uh, he's a stupid idiot. He doesn't communicate with any of us. He just thinks that everyone's going to follow him. But Anton couldn't care less. Despite the tension, orders continued to roll out from his station. And the men were stuck in a pretty tough balancing act. I don't give a fucking rat's ass. They say I'm crazy, but it's just that I move 10 times faster than them. Anton claimed to be moving 10 times faster than anyone else. And whether or not that's true, he definitely wasn't helping to keep the team synced up. And inevitably, things started to fall apart. How long, how long on those New Yorks I now? told you, six minutes. Seriously, guys, it's coming up, six minutes. An hour into the service, Ramsey was on the hunt for a New York strip, but Anton hadn't even started cooking a single one. And had the dumbest excuse possible lined up to explain himself. That's your joke. I know, I didn't hear you on the call, Chef. And then the tension between him and Jason finally imploded. Stop! Yeah, commotion and confusion. Not exactly Ramsey's favorite C words. So, of course, they got kicked out of the kitchen. Wait, subtitle guy, I think that's supposed to be spelled with a K. There, that's better. But guess what? Anton was finding fault with everybody in the room, except for, you know, the guy 
I actually responsible? It's a little hard for me to be a leader when I got the three stooges standing on the other side doing shit. Anton's attitude was anything but acceptable. I mean, I can't pinpoint a single issue because the dude was so full of himself. You're a bitch, Anton. Nothing! Yelling is not doing shit, dude. I'm pissed off. I want to argue. Finally, sous chef Andy took it upon herself to school Anton on, of all things, how to use an oven and keep track of time. Stop no yelling minutes. at me. I've told them it's 14 minutes. What is this, Home Ec 101? But instead of taking the heat, Anton refused to let sous chef Andy take him to task because, wait for it, she was a woman. I'm gonna let some little girl get in my face start ripping a new ass because you got issues on being a woman in the kitchen. And who, boy, did the sexism piss Andy the hell off. Don't you f***ing talk back to me. Don't you ever I'm talk not talking back, to back to me. Yes, you are. I mean, she's in charge for a reason. Anton's elimination was probably just as anticipated as Tiffany's. But when it came calling, he was barely able to process why it happened in the first place. Maybe next time it'll be his restaurant next door to mine. I didn't walk away with the crown, but I was the best out of everybody in there. Ahem. Delusional. Adjective. Characterized by or holding false beliefs or judgments about external reality that are held despite incontrovertible evidence to the contrary. And also Chef Anton Testino. Uh, what? Don't look at me. That's what it says in my dictionary. But I'm far from finished with the blue team. I'm very confident in my abilities. I bring the technical aspect, and I don't want to sound overconfident, but I have a great chance to win. Russell knew how to cook. I guess that's why it was his last name. But it wasn't luck he walked away as the runner-up that season. But his attitude left so much to be desired. Like, take how he handled himself during punishments. Don't talk about the kitchen, because you guys don't know shit about the kitchen. And he just wouldn't shut up about it. Wait, watch your language. Watch my language? I'm a grown-ass man. At one point, he even went full-on micromanager mode, poking his nose into everybody's business. It's gonna be no more Mr. Nice Guy. I'm gonna shove my foot up somebody's ass tonight. And if you can believe it, eventually, that's exactly what he did. I think we should all worry about our stations, and then we can start branching out. Dude, you're trying to be the boss here. You're trying to play Big Willie, but it's not constructive. Boris wasn't super into Russell's leadership style, and neither was I. But then came the big day, Hell's Kitchen's 100th dinner service, where Russell was at the garnish station, at least in theory. The only time he made an appearance was to sling some not-so-nice words at Boris. Get it working first, then, before the oysters, because the oysters don't take as long. However, Boris decided to ignore him and keep his head down. But we all know how Russell rolls by this point. Don't f it. I think it's ridiculous how slow the apps are taking. And he was so obsessed with Boris that he left Rob high and dry. He was not communicating with me. And what's helping me here? I mean, you could tell how intentionally he was ignoring him. But for what? Weren't you trying to run the brigade, like, moments earlier? Where'd that go? You can't walk five steps up to the pass and see what you have on order. My mouth is closed. Talk to me, Russell. Immature doesn't even do it justice. After a streak of losses in both challenges and services, Russell and his team found themselves sifting through trash and prepping both kitchens for what was coming next. But we all know how much Russell loves his punishments. I was thinking about tossing Rob out with the trash, but I can't pick him up. So I said my piece and want him to just own up and, and take some responsibility. And when the lunchtime rolled around with those infamous cheese sandwiches, he drew a line in the sand. Dude didn't even want to touch them. But did he manage to cool off overnight? Absolutely not. He was back to being his same old horrible self in the very next challenge. I need another towel for a second. Somebody give me one. You need towels? I need towels. I don't have one. Well, one thing was for sure. Rob probably hates him more than I do. He noticed how Russell would be up and about when Ramsey was in the kitchen, and how he completely shut down as soon as he left. He shuts down, he shuts up, he doesn't help anybody, and he does his thing. Anyway, when the time finally came for him to face the music, Russell wasn't exactly in the mood for explanations. He brushed off Trev's attempts to clear the air while he was at it, too. Just got dirty. Time into the train tracks. I came out alive, and you are in so much f***ing trouble, bro. In the next service, Russell yet again tried to throw in his two cents. But Trev and Vinny weren't having any of it. 
still has not started the lobster. Stop, final turn, let's go. And now it's up to Vinny and Jillian to complete cooking and plate all three dishes. In fact, he was convinced he could outcook them both in his sleep. See, Russell has more problems with his attitude than I can count. And although he was so close to winning the whole season, nobody was happy seeing him go as far as he did. Okay, now it's time for another peculiar contestant who cooked up a storm during his signature dish challenge, but guess what? It was just the start of the insanity he'd bring to the table. The bird, chef. The pigeon. The pigeon. The one that everybody would be scared to cook with. You see, Matt Hearn started off by making as horrible an impression as he possibly could. You're absolutely the word bolognese. Well, I think he was being polite there. Meanwhile, the contestants couldn't stop poking fun at him. You know what, I could go for some dub breast too. <laughs> I could go for a uh, Pigeon Big Mac. To make things worse, during the dinner service, he messed up the scallops. So it was time for round two with Ramsey. Don't give me a scallop unless it's cooked perfectly. Do you get it? Also, let's not forget that he had the audacity to ask Ramsey to check the cameras to back up his story. Like, zero words, you guys. Zero words. And boy, did things get spicy later on when they went back to the dorm. I don't care if they're mad, they can be mad. Take your tampon out. He managed to dodge the bullet that night, somehow, but it only caused his arrogance to grow tenfold. Damn, man! Right! Hey, why are you all pissed off right now? Sometime later, he proved to the world that he had absolutely no respect for the judges. It's irritated me. Not only is it irritating, it's embarrassing. And, of course, he wasn't the most graceful loser in town. I don't want to sit here and listen to these guys degrading me and talking Oh my god. It's just really starting to irk me. When that was about to call it quits and leave, Ramsey decided to have a one-on-one -on -one to talk him out of it. But, of course, Matt was a man of his word. Do you know why it seems for you? Because you don't care. Okay, so this guy came into the competition, bombed a bunch of dishes, and was just a massive distraction to his whole team and Ramsey to boo. Then, all of a sudden, he was gone. Have I got that right? Well, either way, he seemed pretty upset for a guy that was literally trying to quit 15 seconds ago. And he came up to me with that same I'm up, point blank. Somehow, I'm not surprised. But guess what's worse than presenting Ramsey with an incomplete order? Screwing up his own daughter's dish. Yeah, if we want to talk horribly wrong turns, then I'd be remiss to ignore this one. Well, it's definitely fun to see celebrities showing up at Hell's Kitchen, but it's also a bit of a double-edged sword. Because what if one of them ends up hating your dish? Are those undercooked? Yeah. You're never going to be able to live that down. But nothing can beat what happened with this contestant right here. I mean, he ended up screwing up none other than a dish destined for Ramsey's own daughter. That is so good. That is no. Oh, Yours isn't good? Right yeah, poor Megan had her special birthday meal ruined. But I mean, it was their choice to have it in Hell's Kitchen of all places, so... Well, in season 20, episode 6, during Megan's 21st dinner service, things took a rocky turn when Peyton and Sam found themselves at the meat station. And what did they do? They served a rare steak on the very first ticket. Strong start, guys. First table, guys. Jesus Christ. Now, the two of them got back to work on the refire, hoping that, this time, they would nail the dish. But guess what? The second attempt was so raw that even the white fat from the meat hadn't even started rendering yet. There, again, it's undercooked. It's raw white fat, go on, back in the pan. Considering the team messed up the dish twice, here I was expecting Ramsey to blow a fuse. Surprisingly, though, he held his ground. But this is where things started to go sideways. When Megan ordered the pad thai, Peyton was beaming with confidence. It really is a simple concept. It was the perfect opportunity to showcase his experience cooking noodles. And what better way than to serve the big boss's daughter, right? However, when the dish hit Megan's table, this is how it turned out. That is so good. That is no. Oh, Yours isn't good? Looks like someone wasn't too pleased. What's more, even her friends chimed in with their own thoughts. 
No, Marino was tasked with the difficult job of taking this rejected plate back to the reg kitchen. And I think I know, you know, and even he knows what's about to happen next. This is uh, pretty bland, right? Yeah, Let me take care of this. Thank you okay. very much. Yep, time to eat your mistakes, guys. You. Nothing. Nothing, Jeff. Noodles. Plain, bland, flavorless. I could go on, but you get the idea. There were about a billion negative comments flying around about it. And then came the important question. Who seasoned the noodles in the first place? Although it took a whole minute for him to work up the nerve, Peyton eventually did confess. And just as everyone was getting back to their jobs, Marino dropped another bomb. The one in the blue, they say they are fantastic, so... Despite the rough start, Peyton managed to get his refire accepted. But that doesn't mean Ramsey had forgiven and forgotten. Sometime later, when more raw lamb started to surface, Ramsey decided to call it quits altogether. All of you, get out! Get out! The whole team, just like that, booted out. Well, let this serve as a lesson. Don't have your birthday at Hell's Kitchen. But if you do, and your name happens to be Megan Ramsey, maybe have a bucket handy? After the embarrassing loss, the red team was tasked with nominating three chefs for elimination. And this is where things got really interesting. Bryn started to point the finger at Peyton for everything under the sun. Do you not know what meat feels like when it's done? I do. Meanwhile, Peyton put up a defensive front, claiming he knew everything. But then... Josie reminded him of something important. I'm the one who ran into the past and took it out of the oven. And you thought it was good. Brutal honesty is the best kind of honesty in my book. In the end, the discussion finally boiled down to the bland noodles. And Peyton couldn't come up with a convincing explanation for why they ended up that way. And this drove Keanu up the wall. Like, it's her birthday. You can't just be putting up scraps. In the end, Peyton found himself among the three nominees, with Sam and Josie tagging along. Meanwhile, Bryn was struggling to keep it together and Peyton started to get annoyed. Pissy fit, here we go. This is the that pisses me off. During his plea, Peyton turned the tables and decided to play it safe. He owned up to his mistakes and specifically acknowledged and owned up to the bland noodles. Chef, I know I made some mistakes and I feel absolute about it. There is a limit to everything. Ramsey called him out for his consistently inconsistent performance, and basically for running out of chances. So, goodbye, Peyton. In his exit interview, Peyton was disappointed in his performance, but was happy to have come along for the ride. I gave his daughter a entree on her 21st birthday. But well, Ramsey definitely wasn't happy having him tag along. He said as much himself. Peyton struggled on the blue team and on the red team. One thing's for sure, I don't want him on my team. Yeah, there's no living that down. With that, it's time to see which VIP was on the receiving end of disaster in season 12, episode 6. If somebody's not listening, somebody's not cooperating, I'll throw them out of the kitchen myself. So this time, Ramsey decided it was high time both teams appointed a leader for the upcoming service. Anton saw Ramsey's logic and threw his own hat into the ring. To put his plan in motion during deliberations, Anton tried to subtly hint that he was up to the task. What are you guys? That's how I look at it. I'll take it. We need a strong player. You know what I'm saying? However, Jason thought Anton's head wasn't quite built for that kind of work. Literally. Anton's just too much of a while Jason acknowledged Anton had some serious skills, he thought they only extended to cooking. Hmm. I'm kind of with him on this one. You'll see why later. Once they returned downstairs, Anton decided that he was going to be the leader. Yeah, just usurp the power without even holding an election. However, Gabriel wasn't convinced. He tried to lead with his mouth and put his foot in his ass. That's what I think. Fantastic point. Anyway, with Anton taking the lead and Gabriel pressing X to doubt, the stage was set for an interesting night in the kitchen. And trust me, you're not going to be disappointed. During prep, Ramsey took Anton and Melanie aside for a quick meeting, making it clear that their role as captains had already begun. See, Ramsey had just overheard the women engaging in some light trash talking, and he wasn't too pleased about it. The girls are too cocky. Way too cocky. 
I want to take Melanie down. Hey, as the dinner service kicked off, Anton decided to float like a butterfly and, well, not really sting like a bee. He directed Ralph and Gabriel in making the risottos, with the hopes that if his team listened to him, they could pull off a strong service. But he made it clear that if they didn't follow his lead, he wouldn't hesitate to kick them out. Listening, somebody's not cooperating? I'll throw them out of the kitchen myself. I think he meant it. Despite some skepticism from Gabriel and Richard, sarcastically calling him Super Chef, the first order of appetizers was accepted, and Anton was over the moon. I wish I could go out there and toot my own fucking horn right now and just jump up and down. For a second there, it seemed like the plan Anton had concocted was coming together pretty nicely. However, in the midst of their success, Anton accidentally talked over Ramsey's call out for the next order. And Ramsey wasted no time and bringing him back down to earth. 30 seconds. On old, on away, yes, four, seven. Seven. I'm Sorry, chef. And now for the main act. Holly Marie Combs ordered some scallops. So far, so normal, right? Now, Anton walked up with Chris's scallops, but seemed to have gotten them mixed up with a random plate of hockey pucks laying around. They're overcooked. And the next thing you knew, Anton was throwing Chris under the bus for it. You're making me look bad because you're not doing your job right. Later, Anton kept a closer eye on Chris while he researed a new set. But Chris was offended. He didn't ask for help and didn't intend to accept any. But Anton decided he'd take matters into his own hands when Ramsey stepped out of the blue kitchen. His first fatal mistake. But he was making his second in no time flat. Anton skipped Chris's approval and plated the dishes for the VIPs himself. Unfortunately, the VIPs saw all of this going down. Are those undercooked? They are. And they wasted no time informing Ramsey about it. And boy, was he not pleased. Not only did Anton serve the dishes without Ramsey's approval, but he had the nerve to do so for the VIP tables. Call it a major lapse of judgment or just plain stupidity, but Anton had whatever Ramsey had in store for him coming. Meanwhile, Chris was pretty much being watched 24 seven and Anton had to be extra careful with the third attempt at the scallops. So how do you think that went? Well, thankfully, this time it was accepted. In the end, despite the chaos, the blue team managed to win the service, and Anton wasted no time in taking all the credit. It turned out to be a decent recovery considering the challenges they faced. Also, the red team's performance was so poor that things simply worked out in the blue team's favor. As for Chris, well, it seems like he may have lucked out for a bit, at least in terms of immediate consequences. But what happened during charity night service? was by far one of the most legendary VIP nights, for more reasons than one. Now, this service had a long list of celebrity guests, right from Cameron Mannheim and her son Milo, Chad Lowe, Sabrina Soto, Dylan Bruno, Kevin Zegers, and Parker Young. Everyone who was anyone showed up to dine that night. And believe me, the pressure and excitement had gone up tenfold. In the red kitchen, Motto took on a more vocal leadership role, with Trev and Brett handling the scallops. However, Ramsey and Motto noticed that Trev had been slacking on the scallops, so it was time for a do-over. I just say it, Chef. I'm going to right you. There's no color on this. We need all new scallops. Ramsey had to remind Mia to keep her standards up after he found her standing away from the pass. Are you happy with these? Yes, yeah, Chef. You're the one that maintains the standards. Check your place. Yes, yeah, Chef. He couldn't make it clear enough. This service was big. As things heated up in the red kitchen, the guys hurried to get their scallops plated. We need to divide and conquer. Yes, Be explicit what you want and demand that you get it done. And plate them they did. Because once they moved on to the second course, Brett aimed to not only cook flawlessly, but also to lead the pack at the same time. Over in the blue kitchen, Ariel made leading look easy. Although Ramsey had to get Kanae back on track after she started straying from the herd. Leave the board on so it keeps it warm when we play, you donut. Oh, hey! Yeah, attention to detail was going to be massively important tonight. Anyway, during the plating, Ramsey noticed that Jose's salad had a bunch of bruised parts, and he had to jump right in to fix it. That's amazing. Chris, please enjoy. Thank you so much. Remember when I said attention to detail was going to be massively important tonight? I should hope so, given I said it like 15 seconds ago. But in the end, the women managed to serve their course first, with the men following closely behind. It was a close race, and every second counted. 
Unfortunately, the fourth course was where things started going down the tubes. Despite both teams managing to send out their dishes nearly simultaneously, a red table had some live calves delivered to them instead of the veal they ordered. Mine is completely raw. See, this is what you would call raw. Motto and Trev took partial responsibility for the timing inconsistencies, though, so there was that at least. I mean, let's go eight then. Eight is good. However, Jose admitted something that sent Ramsey towards the brink of madness. He had forgotten to check the veal's doneness before throwing it onto a plate. Oh no. Oh my god. No. It was that kind of carelessness that was going to get someone hurt. Both the VIPs and, well, Jose if he didn't watch his back around Ramsey that you peeled off a radioactive monster's back. It looks like a giant scab. To make matters worse, Marino had to return with more plates, racking up a total of six refires. I think people are getting hit in the head with broken plates. Jose expressed that he should have taken on the responsibility of cooking the veal himself, admitting to completely letting his team down. Ramsey, though, decided amateur hour was over, and that he would make sure the VIPs had something actually edible served to them. So the guys were on dessert duty. At least those they wouldn't be able to undercook. Dude, get over the souffle! Chef. Oh my god. When I called this service legendary, I meant legendarily embarrassing. Speaking of, here comes a VIP that's been bashed time and time again by the fan base for acting too high and mighty. Yeah, she was on the other foot now, because this is one of the few cases where the food was actually fine. But the customer demanded better. Now, which side do you think Ramsey will take at the end of the day here? Well, context time. It was the 13th service of season 4, and the first Black Jacket service too. To make the day even more special, Hell's Kitchen decided to host a special guest for the night. Your winning actress, Tatum O'Neill, and her son. This is Sean McEnroe. How are you, Sean? Well, welcome. Tatum O'Neill. Keep an eye on her, she'll be important later. Anyway, when the service kicked off, all the contestants were geared up to give their best and prove their worth not only to Ramsey, but also the special VIP. Thank you. Chef table here, guys, yes? But sadly, that's not what happened, at least not initially. When the first ticket hit the pass, Michelle Tribble was quick in sending out her salads, but despite that, Ramsey got real irritated with her. Turns out, she used plates instead of bowls. Sometimes, I really wonder where the production team finds their chefs. Because, like, that's a detail I couldn't imagine any chef worth their salt overlooking. But sometime later, when the second order was called out, Nick Peters walked up with a stone-cold lobster tail. Bit of a bigger deal than what it was served on this time around. As a result, the entire team had to start all over again. Over in the dining room, Tatum was finally ready with her order, and the chefs couldn't wait to get started on it. How are you tonight? Good. I have some menus for you, but I got some other. However, the first attempt fell flat on its face. Michelle walked up with a tuna that was still on ice. Stone cold tuna, come here. Come on, touch it, it's stone cold. Yes, sir. Yeah, they couldn't afford to screw up their very first order. Ramsey sent it right back and demanded a refire. You burn, I burn. If you crash, I crash. So get your shit together and let's go. I mean, this wasn't just about Hell's Kitchen's reputation. This was Ramsey's reputation on the line here, and he wasn't willing to settle for any less than perfect. Michelle! Yes, yeah, Chef! You're putting the team behind. Let's go! I'm coming, Chef! Anyway, the next dish that made it to the past was lucky enough to get Ramsey's approval, and the dish went flying out to Tatum's table. Hi, a lobster risotto. But guess what? Tatum started getting nitpicky. I think it could look better. I think this could have looked a little, like, more... A little more of a circle. Yeah. Now, I can't help but wonder if she really felt something was wrong with it, because Ramsey himself had given the dish the green light this time. Meanwhile, seeing her reaction, Nick started getting pissed. I'd rather have a random Joe Schmo at the street sit there and appreciate our food than have Tatum and Yell sit there. Tatum ended up calling most of the dishes she got served mediocre. Give me a break, lady. I mean, honestly. This is mediocre. I want to try that. Meanwhile, one hour into the dinner service, the team moved on to entrees. If the heat wasn't already cranked up to the max, Josh Travato decided to turn it up to 11 by not bothering to communicate with anyone and also set his station on fire. 
Guys, turn off the fire! What's out? Uh, no, 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 Josh. Thanks to Megan's quick thinking, they were able to get the situation under control, but that doesn't mean that Ramsey was happy about it. Who's making those fucking noises again? Josh? What's the matter with that guy? But this is where things get even more interesting. Well, drama reigned over the kitchen, Tatum's table received the Wellingtons and the chicken. Uh, wow. Bon appetit, dog. Bon appetit. Considering her poor feedback on the previous order, how do you think she reacted this time? Well, unforgiving would be pretty generous. Next Ross, that is so lame. Things got so bad that even Ramsey was starting to get tired of her. Now, Ramsey will throw down with an ordinary customer at the drop of a hat, but this is a celebrity we're talking about here. I can't eat it that rare. Me neither, it's like mooing. It's like I hear the mooing. Still though, that wasn't going to be enough to get him to kowtow to her. Oh my gosh. But did it matter to Tatum? Nah, she continued passing remarks on every dish laid out on her table. And Ramsey's rage only grew and grew. I hear moo. But hey, her reaction pushed the team into putting their heads together and whipping up the perfect dish that was sure to put her in a good mood. It's just not up to my standard. I'm gonna get the halibut. When Tatum's halibut order hit the pass, the chefs decided to hit her back with one fit to win an Oscar. I'm gonna hook you up with some Oscar award winning halibut. And guess what? She was finally satisfied. Thank you. So good. Good job diffusing the situation, team. I was sure Ramsey was going to completely blow up for a minute there. Though, I can't help but wonder if I've missed out on other celebrity snafus that have happened on the show. Make sure to get in the comments or my DMs to fill me in. While you're at it, don't forget to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications too. And hey, if you thought this video was crazy, wait till you see the next one. It's even crazier.